I remember seeing somebody once and they said, when you're running these intertypes, they said, when you, when you switch it on in the morning, you just listen to it and you know whether it's going to be a friend that day. They didn't like winter. Paper doesn't run well in winter. But we're in this super building here, with underfloor heating. It's always summer in here, which is brilliant. I wish I could have worked in it all my working life instead of just the past 10 or so. My name's Brian Smith, and this is Ruffer Printing Company. I started Ruffer Printing Company in the 1970s after I'd had an accident um, which put me in a wheelchair in 1968. I first did my first line of type in an occupational therapy department in Southport on an Adana hand press. And after I set this piece of type, I decided I wanted to be a printer. I didn't really know I'd decided this, but um, it stuck with me. And um, when I left the hospital, I bought a hand press and um, things evolved from the hand press and um, it became Ruffer Printing Company. When I was rehabilitating in the spinal unit at Southport, um, that was um, in the Promenade Hospital right on the front at Southport, a ma magnificent building, it's now luxury flats actually, but uh, in the occupational therapy department they had a small Adana press and some cases of type and the occupational therapist uh, introduced me to how to set type from a book and I started setting type and I set type and I remember what I set it was Brian Smith and then there was a big gap and it had my address and I remember it took me probably a week well you only did occupational therapy for about an hour an hour and a half of a day but it took me a week to set this once the type was set uh, we put it in the press and printed it. So I had this piece of paper and it wasn't very good and one or two mistakes. But on the piece of paper, like I say, there was a gap between Brian Smith and my press. The occupational therapist put expert printer. She wrote in and I showed this to my mum and she kept it. She thought it was wonderful. Because my mum and dad visited me for nearly a year every night. 2020 is our 50th year of trading. I started Ruffer Printing Company in 1970. And uh, what I did first of all, it was January the 1st, what I did first of all was I got a registration document from Company's House to say I had registered the name Ruffer Printing Company. And um, on the f first working day in January that year, I went down to the bank and uh, said, I would like to open a bank account in the name of Ruffer Printing Company. And he said, you need a printed piece of paper, you know, you need your letterhead, which I printed on my trusty Adana. And that was 24 point gill stands bold, actually. I remember setting that and 10 point gill for the address on. Now all this information was given to me by Jim Taylor from Berska Printing, who was, you know, he said, you know, you've got to do these things and register it. And he, he really led the way for me, uh, which was very, very kind of him. On my first visit to Berska Printing Company, I um, went in his printing shop, which I thought was huge. And uh, he had two Heidelberg platforms side by side. I thought they looked awesome side by side. 
and um, he had a big old what he called a glockner uh, flatbed press but he had all these racks and racks of type so um, I thought this is huge I'll never ever be able to acquire all this in my lifetime I haven't got the money for this because when I left hospital I think I had 40 quid in my bank account and uh, I was actually I, I when I bought my first Adana, I was given uh, um, I was given a donation by somebody who remained anonymous, and I think it was forty quid, and that enabled me to buy me Adana uh, in the first time, in the first place, uh, because I had nothing. I was what sixteen, seventeen, just left school, um, working on the on the land in between school and college. So um, it, it was difficult. And I thought when I saw all this print, I thought, wow, look at that. Look at all the racks of paper and all this, that, the other. And when I look back now at what he had, and I look round here, I think, ooh, you know, there's a bit of kit there. So it all started, really, uh, on my mum's kitchen table. And um, I set the type up and uh, I made the form up which is the the type in the chase to go in the press and uh, printed but quite it was quite strenuous printing on a Dana press because every one you had to give it a good thump kind of thing uh, so really in effect I didn't really do actually, actually much production printing I used I, my job my usefulness which that was really important, being useful, um, was building the forms up that would print. And that's basically what I did for the next 20 years was um, comping, typesetting, and uh, building forms. Uh, and uh, my dad did the actual printing. Um, well, I used to work all day with my dad and then we'd have our tea and we'd go out again for a few hours afterwards and we worked we didn't have weekends it was our life because one thing that's forgotten if, if you acquire a, a, a disability it's getting yourself into um, back into society because you always think about well what do I look like in a wheelchair you know um, it's difficult and some people never get their head around it. Um, but it's what dragged me back into society. But, um, but the thing is, back in the, in, the, in the 70s, I couldn't go to any premises anywhere because I couldn't get in them. It's like college. I couldn't go to college, which is where I was supposed to go in the next few weeks, because the local college had no ramps, no stairs. Uh, it was all stairs and... They, they didn't want me. They couldn't cope with me. Uh, eventually, I got that much work. I moved into the garage and uh, took over all of the garage. In 1970, no, 73 it would be, I bought my first Heidelberg Platinum. And it was, I remember, £500 a month, £500 total cost. I bought it off Heidelberg. It was reconditioned and it cost me £14 a month with United, Un United Dominions Trust and that was for three years and uh, I've still got that press and I still run it nearly every day. It's a magnificent press and we went into um, offset li litho in the late 70s which was more for photography. And what happened, I stopped comping and got a, a drawing board, letter set and created things using uh, pens and um, letter set basically. Um, back in the 70s, the printing industry was a highly unionised and regulated industry. And if you wanted to buy paper from a paper merchant, it would be problems if you weren't a union shop. So you had to have an agreement, kind of like, not pub you know, not, not publicly known, 
um, that you would not tell anybody where you got your paper from. And the same with trade typesetters because we used to, jobs that used to be heavily, um, uh, used to have a lot of copy in them, like rule books and things, we would send to a trade typesetter who would compose these things and send them back as type, lines of type created on a machine like this. And that trade typesetter would not deal with you if, uh, if the union told him not to, or if the union found out. Oh, I had to be very, very careful. I, I couldn't tell anybody where I got my paper from. I couldn't tell anybody where I got my trade typesetting from. And I had a printer who was in the next village, uh, which was Berska Printing Company. And um, he invited me down and I thought it was going to be, I'm going to have a chat with you and a strong chat and say go away, but it was fill your boots. And, what do you want? Do you want a packet of this? Do you want a packet of that? And, um, it, you know, the, the printing community as such was very, very caring. Um, I remember my story was in uh, a newspaper, the, the Lancashire Evening Post, actually. And um, it was about me running my business. I've been running it for about 10 years then, I think. And um, the next week or so, I received a full font of type from the local type foundry where I used to buy it from in Leyland and it had been donated by a printer and paid for and I'd never never ever found out who but it was like in the in the 80s it's probably 100 quid's worth of stuff which was considerable but when you consider that when I first came out of hospital after a spinal injury the local vicar because I was an altar server he knew me he used to come and see me and he put in the parish magazine if you Brian Smith is printing uh, small things like tickets and that. If you're having a do, go and see Brian about your tickets. But the printer wouldn't print it because his typesetters refused to set it because he said it was taking their business away. So eventually, um, we've actually filled all the, the garage. Um, we ended up with one, two, two printing presses and um, quite a bit of type and guillotine and uh, um, then when we moved into offset life though we needed a camera so we put another cabin at the back and uh, um, I remember I couldn't see over the top of the camera being in the wheelchair so my dad dug a hole in the floor and sunk the camera down so that I could just wheel in there and I could see over the copy board and uh, which was great. Um, so uh, we we gradually carried on and on and on, and we would, we were okay as we were. Uh, unfortunately, my dad got ill and um, uh, he, he died very quickly, and it was a big big blow once he died because he was half of my life, and so we, that took a bit of getting over. But um, um, he loved the to print, you couldn't keep him out of the place and I think he'd be proud of where we've ended up and um, so um, we eventually moved away from the house because uh, I wasn't living there got married and um, we took up premises in Maudsley which was a big step because it was like two and a half thousand square foot uh, so we moved into the premises and which made it better because we had proper business hours and we used to have people calling at kind of like nine o'clock at night after committee meetings and saying, we want some uh, draw tickets for the local scouts, you know, and things like that, which my dad was quite okay with because uh, it got us business and it was just life. They accepted things like that. Used to print for the Conservatives, uh, but uh, I used to print a lot for the Labour Party around the Liverpool area. And I uh, remember doing a lot of famous politicians at the time, and Robert Kilroy Silk. I did, um, when he was, he, I forgot what he was locally, but he was a, he was the local MP or something in Nosley. But he became the, we became part of the constituency. 
And when I was having planning issues, it was a, um, a permission we were forced to put in. Um, even though we were, the council knew we were there, uh, we've even printed the letterheads and uh, civic invitations and that. But somebody reported us and said we shouldn't be there. And so the council came down and said, well, we're going to have to regularise it, so put planning permission in. It should go through. And um, they had to refuse me because we were on a trunk road and the Department of Transport said, it's too dangerous. I went to see Robert Kilroy Silk and he said, um, oh, there's nothing I can do. But he didn't know that the BBC had got interested in the story we had. And um, it went on the local TV that I was being refused planning permission. And then the next day, Robert Kilroy Silk had got it sorted out. And the first thing I know is I'm being rung up by a Daily National, I think it was the Express, saying, did you know that your permissions have been, been granted? I said, I have no idea. Astute political man. I went to an exhibition and um, I saw somebody using a Apple Mac um, and a friend of mine who started the Green Bank project in Liverpool, Jerry Kinsella, he said to me, he said, you could approach this government agency, Access to Work, and he said, if you put a good enough case to them, they will help you to buy this because it will help you overcome your disability and keep you in work, and make you a viable proposition as an employee. Even though you're self-employed, you can do this. So with my um, supportive wife, who knows how to write things in an order that people would like to read them, who make decisions, we put together a, a case and I rang access to work and we basically asked them for £10,000 to buy this equipment. And to our amazement, they said yes. And would you like to come down to London for a free, free weekend and demonstrate this to um, a group of politicians? Which we did, and we had a very interesting time. I won't say they were particularly interested in what I was doing, but and then that's when the floodgates opened with desktop publishing and and that's when a lot of businesses like mine started to struggle because people could do it with not so much investment kit because the prices were tumbling and the advances that were made were enormous. That was our introduction into to, to digital, which is now where we're at. All our copy, commercial copy, in the main, I would say 98% of this 98% of this is, 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 is computer generated, either by us or by the client. Um, but hopefully we'll get more and more back onto letterpress because people are realising that digital output is a clone of the last copy and there's no, there's no soul in it. Whereas if you have a letterpress copy, no matter what you do, how good of a pressman you are, each copy is slightly different and it's got an impact, it's got an impression, you can feel the quality. I got my intertype probably five, six, seven years ago, I can't remember now. I never knew how to run one, I wasn't trained. And I had this friend in Preston, John, and he came down and showed me, but unfortunately, he was dying at the time and he knew it, and um, he could only help me so much that I was on my own. But since then, I've met a community of um, X intertype, linotype operators from um, um, people who used to set Macmillan paperbacks, all interesting people, um, and uh, a lot of Liverpool Echo uh, comps. In fact, we 
we had three of them come down just to have a chat and set a line just for old time's sake. Um, then it's, it's really nice and some of the tales they will tell are unbelievable. But these things, they, kept, they, were, they, they were really, really uh, revolutionised the printing industry and they were held back a bit because people thought that it would kill the printing industry. They're aimed at the newspaper industry because you can type away, set a line of type, it comes out, and then you don't have to dissemble the type, you don't have to diss it. The beauty about um, the intertype is that once, once you'd set your line of type and you'd used it in your form, you could then recycle it and put it back in the pot to be remelted into another line. Um, so you w there was no constant need to have cases upon cases of type that was re essentially types only got a certain amount of time for life in it and depending on how good your press operators are the more impression you put on the less that you're going to get out of that type but with every edition now you get in a fresh set of type improved quality and cut costs. You set your line of type, and the moulds go away along the distributor and they drop back to where they were. So what it did for the actual printing industry was quite the opposite of what it was expected I think. And where newspapers would only bring out maybe one edition every couple of days, week, whatever, they could produce three or four. We bought um, an Arab letterpress um, platen. It's a treadle platen. It was built in 19, no, 1890. So it's 130 years old. And it was built by a man in Halifax who later became the Lord Mayor of Halifax, Mr. W Joshua Wade. It's a press with a history. It's a piece of kit. I bought it off a friend in Preston. And this friend, even though I didn't know at the time, he used to work at the trade typesetters back in the 70s, proofing and, and packing my jobs that he used to stick on the bus, that he used to deliver the stuff to me. Um, so it's, it's kind of like full circle. Um, but this, this, this press is quite magnificent to see running. And it has a, a noise, it has a soul. And it kind of just rocks along, clump, click. Also, we have a, a, a Van der Cook flatbed. Um, we've just replaced it with a powered one. And the, the size of this thing is awesome. And the power of it. And the rolling power and the crispness of crispness of the print is is really really good. Um, these machines were built so many years ago, but they just sing along. So um, we're we're bidding the 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 the, the, um, the premises for about 15 years. And um, eventually we got the chance to come to Cedar Farm. Uh, wonderful premises and uh, a great place. And we, we saw the opportunity at Cedar Farm. Uh, I was beginning to realise that Offset Litho was limited in the amount of time it had left as a commercial viability for, for rougher printing. And I started to, 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 to think about how we could keep moving forward um, and uh, having seen what letterpress can do and what people were buying nowadays and what they wanted they wanted something that was different I thought that a meld of digital and letterpress and foil uh, were probably the right way for rougher printing to go so that's what we did. Letterpress was always the thing. Um, it was always the most rewarding. Um, 
of, 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 of all the things. And gradually, over the years, we now just do digital printing. We don't do any offset light, though. But we have more letterpress capability because we have invested. We bought probably one, two, three, four, four letterpress presses in the last 10 years. And we bought most of the type back that we actually scrapped. In the 80s, 90s, we sold type at very low prices because nobody wanted it, and we bought it back now. We bought um, uh, a foiler, a small one, a hand foiler. We've since got a larger one, a big Heidelberg. And um, we do die cutting, which, which makes things uh, more unique, which is what people are after. So we stopped chasing the volume and started chasing the value, you know, the, to try and get jobs that were worth some money. And um, so that's the way we've been going, always with this in mind that we would like to provide a teaching facility and an experience for people in letterpress. It's, it's, it's a great passion to have nice clean people come in and to send them out full of ink and happiness. And that's, that, that's still the goal, but um, it's getting pushed a bit further along the line at the moment. But we'll get there. Um, we will get there.